Our next speaker uh, is a good friend of mine, needs no introduction. It's me. <laughs> and we're not going to talk about any of that stuff this morning, other than I want to give you an overview of the Pentacam HD and AXL and how to utilize that in your practice as we've talked about. Here are my financial disclosures, none of which are relevant to what, except for the Oculus. And my slide presentation and the interpretation guidelines are available at hicksope.com, H-I-C-S-O-A-P. And the two handouts that you want to get that have all the slides are number one and number two. It has all the presentations that I will have at the uh, Ascaris meeting here. Now, as we said, the purpose of the holiday report is to facilitate the presentation of information for the busy cataract and refractive surgery. And I know after doing this for 43 years, that's when I did the first topography unit with Gene Reynolds uh, in Oklahoma, uh, that you don't sit in front of that machine. Your technician does that. So our goal is to provide a report that uh, makes it easy for you to determine exactly what you need. Now, what we will be discussing and the panelists that we have today will be a report that's version 1.21, revision 31, or higher. The ones before that won't have some of the uh, new features that are available, so it's important that you have that. Now, one of the things that I always end up dealing with when I have this kind of thing is that people uh, end up finding that they want to adjust the uh, they want to adjust the uh, measurements or the display that's on the thing. And what happens is when you do that, the problem is this one on the left uh, that you see here, uh, let me back up one, on the left is exactly the same exam as the one on the right, but the users made the adjustments. And you see on the left, everything's green. And what you'll see is when we talk about this, yellow is suspicious and red is danger. And so it's important that the user, so that every time you look at a map, for everyone, for each person in every location all over the world, we're all looking at the same map. And I've gotten the adjustments for sensitivity and colors that they're just what you need to be. Now there's five overlays that you need to know. That is things that are on top of the map. The first one is this, uh, dashed line. It's the pupil margin. Now it's not a circle. It follows the contour, the margin of the circle, and that's the pupillary perimeter. Now the pupil's usually photopic because the bright light's there. Now the second thing that you see is this little crosshair right there, and that's the pupil center. So it's the center of that, the centroid, if you will, of that perimeter. The third thing you see is the center of the uh, iris or limbus, the iris area or the limbus. Uh, so that's the center of that, the brackets. The fourth is that little white uh, circle with a black dot in the middle, and that is vertex normal or the visual axis. And the final is that little black circle, number five at the bottom, and that is actually the thinnest part of the cornea, the pachymetry minimum. So those five overlays are the things that you need to remember. The pupillary margin, the uh, pupil center, the center of the limbus, and the uh, black dot is vertex normal or the visual axis, which when you're centering lenses and stuff comes into play. And the final is the black circle, which is the center uh, of the pachymetry min. All right, now here is a typical example of a person with regular astigmatism that we look at. And the map is set up to where the left upper panel is the demographic data, the upper middle panel we'll talk about has data in the upper right. And then there are three columns. The first column has topography information. The second column has pachymetry information. And the third has elevation information. And so let's look at each of those. First, let's look at the upper middle panel. Now, the upper middle panel has the quantitative information that you need to know about for both cataract and refractive surgery. 
The upper two boxes there are the EKR65, and we'll talk more about that later, but those are the values that you use for K readings because they take into account the front and the back of the cornea and some other algorithms that take care of if you've got keratoconus, previous refractive surgery, it doesn't matter. Whatever the irregular astigmatism, those two values have taken all that into account over a four and a half millimeter zone and taken those values. The second thing you see there is the total SA, spherical aberration. And that term is actually the sum of the central Zernikes, uh, 4, 6, and 8, which is what Koch and others have shown is the best thing to match with an aspheric IOL. IOLs come in 0, minus 18, and 27, and you can match that with what you get for the spherical aberration. The next thing is the RMS HO wavefront error. Now, that's something that you're not familiar with. But there's several studies out there that show us that's going to determine the quality of the vision. That value for the RMS higher order wavefront error is a value that can predict for you whether or not you should use a multifocal lens. Because with that value, what you see down there, the normal in the population is 0.37. Okay? Right here. 0.37 diopters, uh, microns. If it's over 0.66, you've got about a 50% chance of complaining of halos. If it's over 1, you've got a 100% chance that the patient complains of halos with a monofocal lens because they complained after they had refractive surgery before they ever had a cataract. So at 0.66 is where it gets in a suspicious zone and over 1 micron. So that value tells you the quality of vision that's limited by the cornea. So it's right there. Now, on the upper right-hand panel, we've got a number of values there. We've got the pupil diameter that you see. We've got the horizontal white to white. Uh, it shows you where it's located. So that's angle alpha, the tilt of the eye, if you will, the pachymetry min. And then we have what's called the estimated pre-refractive surgical value. In other words, we estimate what the K reading is before the patient had refractive surgery. That value is what you plug into the double K method, it's called, where you don't size the eye with the K readings today on somebody that's had refractive surgery because they're abnormal. You put in the value before refractive surgery and most of the time you don't have those values. This estimates that based upon the topography and tells you what that value is. It also gives you the external ACD, and it also estimates the refractive change from the refractive surgery. So all of those values, and it'll be zero about in normal corneas. And then finally, it gives you what's called cord mu, which used to be called angle kappa, but it's from the center of the pupil to the visual axis, okay? If that value is more than 0.42 millimeters, then you've got a problem. That also has a problem with multifocal lenses if they're diffractive. So that value lights up in yellow when they're suspicious and the little boxes up in the panel turn yellow or red if they are flags that that's a problem. So that's what those things have. Now on the topography map, just like the others, we have topography, corneal thickness and elevation in each column and those are Blue and green if they're normal, yellow if they're suspicious, and red if they're abnormal. All right, so here's a typical topography map. Now when we look at that, the first thing we notice is, on the left, are the topography. Now the first thing you should look at is those little semi-meridian bars, those little bars that come down to form the axis, and in this guy, they're pretty good. You notice that they're pretty straight. The top map is an axial map. The bottom map is a tangential. And the tangential is just more sensitive at looking at the geometry of the cornea. We don't go into detail, but it's one that's more sensitive. For example, to the center of the Earth is 8,000 miles. If I had a hemisphere that's one mile in, hemi, uh, in radius, it would go from 8,000 to 8,001. That wouldn't even show up as a blip on anything. But on a local radius or tangential map, it goes from 8,000 miles to one mile. And so that thing shows up like a big old red uh, flashlight. So the point is the tangential map is much more sensitive because it looks at local radii, not the axial radius to the center of the Earth. So that's more sensitive. But that's the first column. 
Second column is pachymetry. Now, the normal pachymetry map on the top always gives you the thinnest in the middle, that little black circle, and it gets thicker as we go out because it's a negative meniscus lens. But the relative pachymetry map gives you the percentage thicker or thinner from normal at every location. So those little values there that you see at minus 1.4, minus 2, minus 0.5, that's what the uh, thickness should be at that point is zero. And if it's a little thinner or thicker, plus or minus a couple of percent is normal. But that is very helpful in keratoconus and refractive. And then the final column is the elevation for the front and the back. And it's relative to the normal cornea, which is a prolate toric ellipsoid. So it's a little steeper in the center and flattens out. So the values are much more sensitive because it compares to the normal cornea. And those values are much more accurate on the back surface because when you have a little pooch on the front surface, the lid rubs the epithelium off and it gets back to normal again. That can't happen on the back, so the back map is much more sensitive. Now on the back surface, the top up there has the EKR65 EKR as a function of pupil size. If you've got somebody with a very small or large pupil, well then you might go to a different value than 4.5 because four and a half is the normal pupil size in the refracting lane for a patient that has a cataract, 65 year old. All right, to the right of that is a little curve. That blue curve is a average value of the EKR65 as a function of pupil size. So those values will agree all the way across for the blue value. The bottom value down there is a plot of the powers within the four and a half millimeter zone. And what you see is for this person with a normal uh, dumbbell or a bow tie uh, astigmatism, you see that the powers are a little more for the steep and the flat meridian, and it dips down and because there's not as much power in between. But it gives you a plot of the frequency of what those are. And then finally, that little map in the lower half is the EKR60 power, power map, which takes in the front back of the cornea and shows you where those powers come from. Now, in IOL power calculations, you want to use the EKR65, as we said, because you need to have taken into account the back part of the cornea. And it turns out that if you have corneas that are irregular, uh, it's not just a simple average of what all those powers are. For example, in keratoconus, what we find is the patient has a bifocal cap on the cornea. They have extra power there. Well, the cornea, you don't look through the average of 40 and 46 diopters of power. They actually look through the 40 diopter paracentral area for distance, and they look at the 46 diopter when you hold something about 10 centimeters in front of the eye. Take the next keratoconus patient and take a near card and have them hold it about 10 to 16 centimeters. They'll be able to read the bottom line because they've got a five to six diopter cap that's bifocal there. But they don't use that. It interferes with the distance vision, and that's why you have to take that paracentral power, and that's what this does, the EKR65. So if we look at a couple of patients here, what you see is, again, in this patient, that upper left-hand corner, look at the breaks in those meridian lines. That patient is not going to have good vision with the toric IOL because there is no axis that accurately represents their astigmatism. They've got an asymmetric bow tie with irregularity. So even though we can give you the best K readings you can use, you can predict right there that that guy is not going to have very good vision because he doesn't have a regular astigmatism. Always look at the regularity of those semi-meridians if you're considering a toric IOL. And then again, when you look at that, uh, it gives you a distribution power of the map, and this was a keratoconus case, and what you see is they have a bifocal cornea, and he uses that high power to look up close, and the distance power is closer to that lower power. Now, this works no matter what the irregular astigmatism caused. PKP patients, post-refractive, keratoconus, corneal scars, any source of irregular astigmatism, those values give you the best. Now, we've done studies on this and showed you a normal person is going to have a big peak and the value of their mean cornea is going to be very steep. It's on the left. A LASIK patient has about a 5 diopter spread and an RK patient has almost a 13 diopter range in their corneal powers. 
So the accuracy of the K reading is directly related to the irregularity. So you'll be within a quarter of a diopter on a normal, within plus or minus a half a diopter on a LASIK patient, PRK, and RK, it's plus or minus one diopter. So it doesn't make sense to target for plain O in an RK patient knowing that you've got a tolerance of plus or minus one. You target a little bit more myopic. And finally then, that's what we're saying, the EKR65, you use all of those, and the only time you use a smaller aperture is when the patient has a very constricted pupil. Now in thinning disorders, as we mentioned, one of the hallmarks of keratoconus is a uh, pachypetry min in which the Y value is much farther inferior than normal. The normal is about 0.2 to 1 tenth of a millimeter below the center, but in keratoconus, they end up with almost 0.6 or greater. So you look at the hot spot on topographies, and what you see here is there's no red on this map that you see here. It's yellow, except for right down. Okay, so we look at this, and we say, gee, yeah, there's some irregular astigmatism. It's got a little warmer down here. Yeah, the relative pachymetry map looks like it's got some yellow, and this is decentered inferiorly. And yeah, the elevation's a little bump here, and yeah, there's more here, but that's suspicious until you look at the other eye. And then you look at the other eye and you say, well, that's not suspicious anymore. That's keratoconus. So that first eye was a form thrust on the left, and it was frank on the right. And so you always look at both eyes to determine because it's almost always asymmetric in a keratoconic eye. All right. Here is pellucid marginal degeneration, just to show you some examples. And what you see is that crab claw. The crab claw on the axial maps, and the crab claw is a result of this area down here, right here, thinning and bulging up. And so what you see on the relative pachymetry map, it's thinner than it should be, and you see these elevations down here. So that's a classic crab claw a moderate crab claw, and here's the other eye, and severe. So you can't miss those because the crab claw always shows up. All right, let's look at this one. We see some irregularity on both the topography maps. We see that the thin spots in the center, but we notice on the relative pachymetry map that it's almost 25% thinner in the center than normal, and we look over on the elevation maps and we see that there's no protrusion or anything. So this is a typical post-refractive surgery LASIK patient with thinning in the center and no elevation or protrusion, so it's okay. But look at the other eye. Same thing, more thinning in the center, but look at that lower right-hand corner. Protrusion of almost 15 microns. This guy's got ectasia. He's got to have cross-linking. So when you look at that back surface map, it shows you exactly which of these eyes needs, has a problem and is going towards ectasia. So what I've hoped to show you today is an overview of the holiday report and how the utility for both refractive, refractive and cataract surgery can help you very quickly by just remembering a color code of blue and green is normal, yellow is suspicious, and red is bad on both the quantitative and the topographic and all the maps all in the report.